And it is now my pleasure to introduce your presenter for today, Eileen Castell. Excuse me, <clears throat> is a licensed clinical professional counselor. She has over 16 years combined of academic professional training, providing counseling and supervising clinicians in the field. She's got extensive experience in education as well as a background which includes some animal welfare activities. Um, and I will now go ahead and pass this over to Eileen. Thank you, Robin. Um, your tail end of your voice was great in coming through. Earlier it was a little PC, but um, I think more now it's going to be um, whether or not you guys can hear me. So just let me know if I get choppy. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm excited for this third webinar on coping skills when life is uncomfortable. Uh, for the most part today, we're going to jump right in and talk about coping skills. I do want, before we get started, for you guys to, if you have a piece of paper, that would be great. If not, go ahead and just um, think through these questions that I'm gonna pose to you in your head, but if you have a piece of paper, that would be wonderful. I want you to think about three things right now that have been causing you either stress, sadness, or anxiety. So think about three things that have been causing you stress or sadness or anxiety. Go ahead and list those out. And I want you to take a moment and think about what are your thoughts about each of those three things? What are the thoughts that you're having about that thing that's making you anxious or that thing that is making you sad or stressed? What are your thoughts about it? And finally, what are, what are some of the feelings that are there? I know we're talking about three feelings like sadness, stress, and anxiety, but sometimes there's also other emotions that go with these experiences. So just hold on to your notes or what you may have thought about in your head, and I'm sure you're going to be able to come back to those things throughout this seminar as we go through. So we're going to cover what our objectives are for the day. I'm going to talk about definitions and statistics on mental health. I'm waiting for the slide to load. There we go. So I'm going to talk about just some quick definitions and statistics on mental health and illness. I'm going to talk about influences and mitigations around some of these things like sadness, anxiety, stress. I'll talk about a sense of control and how that impacts things. I'm going to cover the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access that happens in our body when we're stressed, which is really important to cover. And then, of course, we're going to spend a lot of time on actual coping skills and strategies. Okay, so a lot of these things we probably don't need time to really define because most of us are familiar with stress, sadness, or depression, anxiety, um, compassion fatigue, which is the physical and or mental exhaustion and emotional exhaustion um, experienced by those who care for sick or traumatized people or animal over an extended period of time. And then grief, which a lot of you are probably exposed to from time to time, given the work that you're involved in. So uh, the top causes of stress is job pressure, money, health and relationships, and um, the American Institute of Stress reports that 80% of workers feel stress on the job and nearly half say that they need help learning and how to manage stress. And about 42% say that their coworkers need to learn how to better manage stress. The American Psychological Association conducted a survey about stress. It's a bit outdated at this point, but it was in 2004, um, but that, that survey concluded that 54% of Americans are concerned about their level of stress in their daily life. So this is clearly a really important topic. Some 
Other statistics, uh, globally, one in 13 suffer from anxiety. So if there are 40 of us on this webinar, then that means that definitely there's absolutely three people for sure that experience anxiety and suffer from that um, that are listening. So anxiety disorders tend to be more reported in the Western societies. And conversely, depressive symptoms and disorders are more reported in Asian and the Middle Eastern countries. Depression affects more than 15 million Americans, so about 6.7% of the U.S. population in a given year. And anxiety disorders affect about 40 million adults, which is 18% of the population every year. And then in the UK, nearly a fifth of adults experience anxiety or depression, according to the latest figures. So um, th this is something that needs to be addressed, definitely, which we're doing. Um, and it just helps us know that depression and anxiety, they're found in every society all over the world, not just in the Western world. Um, just a quick note, PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, does fall under the umbrella of anxiety disorders. And you can suffer from both anxiety and depression at the same time. Okay, so influences and mitigations. So genetics, um, you know, genetics definitely influence our tendency for stress, anxiety, or sadness. Um, there's a her heritability to anxiety and depression. If it runs in your family, you're more likely to experience these things. And also, if you've suffered from depression or anxiety before, it's more likely to happen again. So I'm going to talk a bit about level of avoidance. Um, we, we all experience unpleasant thoughts, unpleasant emotions, unpleasant sensations, and there is a natural tendency to want to avoid uncomfortable experiences. Experiences. So this is what we call experiential avoidance. We try to avoid uncomfortable experiences, hence calling it experiential avoidance. So um, attempts to avoid uncomfortable thoughts, feelings, memories, physical sensations, um, or other unpleasant internal experiences actually creates more harm in the long run. So some examples of, of avoidance is... Um, you know, if avoiding an argument with a friend, putting off an important task because of the discomfort of it evokes, like maybe having to organize your bills, uh, having to break up with a significant other or share uncomfortable information with another family member, not taking advantage of an important opportunity to avoid feelings of failure, um, or even avoiding social gatherings because of the anxiety it leads, it leads to. So, um, these are just some examples. So we do have a natural tendency to avoid difficult thoughts and emotions because, well, they're unpleasant and that would make sense. However, the irony is that the harder we try to avoid difficult thoughts and emotions, the more powerful they actually become. So if you've ever noticed if you're trying to avoid something, it feels like, you know, that awareness about what you're avoiding is still kind of hovering around you and following you around all day. So avoiding anxiety or, or some things that make us sad tend to make it worse. Uh, I'll say more about avoidance in um, a slide or two and talking about how to overcome that. Um, coping skills and abilities and how a person adapts. Have you ever noticed or thought to yourself um, about somebody else's situation? Like, I don't know why they're having such a hard time. I don't, I don't really think it's a big deal. Or even the opposite, I can't believe um, how well that person's like coping with things. You know, so how well, how well we handle life stressors um, does depend on all the other things I've mentioned thus far, but also on our coping abilities. And we learn our coping from um, our coping, meaning like self-soothing. So we learn, we learn this through our caretakers early in life. We learn it through vicarious learning of others, and we learn through the society that we live in how to cope. Um, so the great news is, is no matter what, though, and no matter what you've learned in terms of coping, even if it is avoidance, uh, that it can be improved and refined. Um, we're going to talk about how important support is, I think, on the very next slide. And that it's a really key component when you're dealing with stress, sadness, or um, anxiety. And then this idea of a sense of control. So uh, 
control is is an interesting thing, whether it's real or imagined. Um, believing we have a sense of control helps us think better, helps us problem solve better, and helps us increase our confidence. So you often will want to ask yourself in a situation, maybe when you look back on those three things you wrote at the very beginning of the webinar, ask yourself what you have control over. And sometimes people's first response is, I don't have control over anything. And when you really go through and look at even just the small things that you have control over, it really helps us feel more empowered. Um, so for example, we can't control how other people respond to us. We can't control what duties other people complete. We can't control um, if someone's willing to resolve a conflict with us or not. But what we can control is once we get through this webinar, you'll have a better understanding of this, but we can to a, a good degree control our thoughts. We can manage our emotions. We can control how well we prepare for something. We can control how we communicate to somebody with kindness or harshness. We can control um, our approach. We can control our coping. So when, when you go through and list out all the different nuances and all the things that you do have control over, um, it again helps with all of these things that are listed at the bottom of this slide. Okay, so uh, you're gonna see this feeling wheel <laughs> again in this um, webinar. So hopefully you guys can see it. I know there's a lot of information on it. I want you to go ahead and just identify your current feelings. You'll, you'll start at the center and then move outward and get more and more specific with the feeling that you might be experiencing even today. And you'll see that they're categorized by the primary main emotions like, you know, anger, mad, scared, um, sad. And then as you go out, they get more detailed. In order to remove avoidance, we have to identify our feelings. Um, I have actually seen and witnessed, well, I'll talk more about that later, but I, I've definitely seen even just clients alone, once just even identifying their emotion tends to help the emotion subside and pass or, or decrease in intensity. So you definitely want to, um, you can use a tool like this and identify your feelings. You want to admit that the feelings exist, even if they're unpleasant, right? So even if they're unpleasant, they're not going to harm us. They're just uncomfortable. Step three would be to take a step back and gain some distance from the situation. So say, take time to figure out what's triggering those feelings. It's not just that someone else was rude to you, for example. It might be that you feel um, not heard. And when someone was talking down to you, it made you feel not heard. And that's what really triggered the frustration or sadness, for example. Step four, find support. Talk about your feelings with someone who you trust and or you can write them down, journal about them, just process them. And then step five, again, going back to that sense of control, ask yourself, what do you have control over in this situation? Even if at the end of the day, nothing can change, you have control over your ability to accept a situation. Um, and acceptance is a process within itself, but that is in your control. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about finding support. So, um, you know, a lot of you listening today are probably caretakers, which means part of your identity is being strong and independent and helping, right? And so to then reverse that and ask other people for help, it's the opposite of part of your identity of being strong and independent. A lot of people see asking for help as not being strong and independent um, or feeling like you're burdening others with your problems. So this is reaching out and getting support from others. If you do struggle with that or you tend to avoid that because um, there's something uncomfortable about it for you, really, I recommend spending some time trying to work through that with yourself or with another health professional. Um, but a support network is made up of, of course, friends, family, peers. Um, we basically want people to understand us and depend on us or that we can depend on during um, tough times. We need people to listen to us, to give us honest feedback. And research shows a ton of benefits to having a support system. 
That includes increasing our wellness. It improves our coping. It gives us longer lives. It reduces our stress, our anxiety, our sadness. It supports a sense of belonging. It wards off loneliness. It makes us feel good and gives us a sense of comfort and security. Some people need large support networks. Others need small. So what I'd like for you independently to do on your own is to go through these questions. And I want you to ask yourself, what are your support needs? Meaning, how much support do you need? When do you tend to need it? And maybe in what form do you prefer it be in? Is it a hug? Is it talking out loud with somebody about what's going on? Is it that you want people you care about to check in on you from time to time? Do you want somebody to bring you dinner or do something nice for you? So it's always good to know what our needs are. Um, I want you to think about who do you currently turn to and maybe why? And who else might you be able to turn to that you don't currently do at this time? The wider the support network we have, the better off we'll be. So I hope on your own time, you will go through those questions for yourself and process. So it's important for us to talk about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access that happens in our body. So basically, this is the system that kicks into gear when we experience stress. So I'm not going to overwhelm you with, with too much science. Um, I'm going to give you some basics. So the HPA controls reactions to stress. Um, so this includes our digestion, our immune system, our moods, our emotions, our sex drive, and our energy levels. So the hypothalamus is influenced by stress and also influences our wake and sleep cycle. So when we wake up in the morning, we have high levels of cortisol. And then in the evening before we go to bed, that cortisol is really low in our body. So low cortisol allows us to sleep and relax. Keyword, relax. So um, high cortisol, which happens with stress and particularly chronic stress, um, high cortisol depletes our adrenal gland, which causes chronic fatigue. And if you notice when we're stressed, we also crave sugars and that's because cortisol affects our blood sugar level. So um, when we have high cortisol levels, um, we know that it's linked to stress. We know that then that is linked to depression and anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, chronic fatigue, insomnia, and burnout. So being chronically stressed is not just an annoyance that doesn't feel good. It has effects on our body and how our different systems operate. So it is important to cope. And I'll talk about engaging the parasympathetic nervous system here in a moment. So just a smidge more on the HPA access axis. Um, so for for animals, this all this all of this goes for animals too. This is not just for people. Um, so for animals and humans, exposure to like a healthy range of stressors early in life is um, going to enhance your HPA uh, regulation and promote a lifelong resiliency to stress and help people better regulate and animals, their emotions. Um, but conversely, early life extreme or prolonged stress, kind of like I'm sure for sure some of the animals you care for and maybe some of you in your own current lives perhaps, um, this causes a hyperactive HPA axis and contributes to a lifelong vulnerability to stress and difficulty regulating emotions. So with acute stress, like a healthy range of stress, um, you'll get uh, something like meeting deadlines or being stuck in traffic. Um, this causes an increase in your heart rate and adrenaline and an increase in cortisol. This is going to sound familiar if we call it the fight or flight response for most of you. That's what happens. Um, and then after the stress episode is, is over, your body returns to its normal state. So that's fine. But with chronic stress experienced over a period of time, um, this really creates a drain on your body. It's, it's not so much of the chronic stress, it's, it's not so much what the stress does to the nervous system, 
but what continuous activation of the nervous system does to other bodily symptoms. So chronic stress can lead to heart, digestive, increased vulnerability to illness, um, muscular pain, a lot of people have back pain, for example, uh, memory difficulties, concentration impairments, mood shifts, and then of course, anxiety, stress, insomnia, and burnout, things like that. So you might be able to see this within yourselves or friends, or even maybe some of the animals that you work with. So all of this is leading up to why we need healthy coping skills, right? So before we talk about healthy, we want to also just, I just, this is the one slide. I just want to talk about unhealthy coping. So technically the word is called maladaptive coping. It's um, a coping tech, it's coping techniques that we use, um, but they're only short term. They really don't help us in the long run. So for example, if we're stressed, we might go home and watch TV because we just want to like check out for two hours. But at the end of the day, or when we wake up the next morning, nothing has really been done to alleviate the stress or actually cope with it. We just basically checked out for two hours. So um, maladaptive coping is avoidance of uncomfortable thoughts and feelings, uh, criticizing yourself, so negative self-talk, self-medicating, yelling, withdrawing, procrastinating, reassurance seeking also is not the best coping skill because we need to be able to self-soothe ourselves and not be dependent necessarily on others. Seeking support is good, but having that be the only outlet of needing reassurance can sometimes not be healthy. And then excessive rumination. So rumination meaning you just think over and over and over again about the situation. All right, so let's talk about the good stuff. So we're going to talk about identification of emotions, cognitive restructuring. So cognitive meaning thinking and um, so changing your thinking. We're going to talk about self-awareness and acceptance, perspective taking, meditation and mindfulness, neuroplasticity of the brain, a uh, quick note on grounding techniques, and then we'll end with positivity and silver linings. As we go through this, I will leave room for questions if, if you have those. Okay, so here's this feeling wheel again. Um, I, I really do use this, um, and I, I have a group practice. There's myself and five clinicians, and every one of us use this with our clients, our high-functioning clients. This is not for um, necessarily just people that are struggling with emotion identification, but I we use this with our very high functioning um, professional clients as well. So um, it's a great tool. If you just put in your search engine uh, feeling wheel, you will find all sorts of these and I would just save it to your phone so you can grab it whenever you need it. Um, and again, the, the purpose of identifying our emotions is to um, reduce the tendency for avoidance, acknowledge the feeling, and like I said, a lot of times I've seen this just reduce the uncomfortable feeling in and of itself, like right away. And sometimes other coping skills aren't even necessarily needed. So just getting in the habit of being able to really identify the feeling and not just a broad category, like I'm sad, um, but being able to say, no, I feel, um, I feel bored right now. I feel a little remorseful. And then to be able to pinpoint where that's coming from. So moving into cognitive restructuring, we are going to talk about your thoughts. We're going to talk about how they affect your feelings and how your feelings affect your behaviors. So, okay. So before we can change our, our thoughts, we have to know what we're working to change. So thinking errors are very common and they happen all day long um, and they affect our moods. So I'm gonna cover some of the thinking errors. And the point is, is for you to be able to begin to pay attention to your thoughts throughout the day that happens so automatically, we barely even notice them. And to then begin to identify um, where your thinking is problematic and causing you um, sadness, anxiety, stress. So thinking errors is basically faulty thinking 
our brains do it for a reason. We don't have time to talk about that today, but they're thinking errors. Um, it's faulty thinking. And so when we're feeling down, it's easy to overgeneralize our unhappy uh, life events and, and think in very absolute and unchangeable ways. So we tend to think in worst case scenarios, we think in black and white, uh, all, all or nothing or extremes. So one of the first thinking errors I'm going to cover is catastrophizing. So that's predicting a negative outcome. It makes us feel helpless and magnifies the outcome. So something like, I'll never find love, or I'm feeling sad this morning, and then fearing that your depression is going to come back. So I'm feeling sad this morning, so my depression must be coming back, when those two things aren't necessarily true. So all or nothing thinking is a binary way of thinking that does not account for shades of gray and can be responsible for a great deal of negative evaluation of yourself and others. An example would be I messed up sharing the mission statement of our organization and they'll never donate now. I did a bad job at this presentation. I'm a terrible public speaker. I didn't get anything done today. So those are some examples. Um, and as I'm going through these, you can think back to the original three items at the very start of the webinar. I asked you guys to think about list three things that you're dealing with and write what your thoughts are about them um, to see if any of those match these things we're covering. Should and must thinking. So this focuses on what you can't control versus the actual situation and makes us feel not good enough and causes stress. So I should be able to prevent our rescue from getting injured or I should have been over this by now if something's still bothering you. The last one I'm going to discuss is uh, personalizing. So this is when you hold yourself personally responsible for an event that isn't entirely under your control. Personalization tends to lead to guilt, shame, and feelings of inadequacy. There are a lot more thinking errors out there. These are just the, what are there, no, four that I'm covering today. If you want to learn more, you can just plug in thinking errors into your search engine and get a lot more information. Okay, so we've talked about thinking errors. Now we're going to talk about how do you change your thoughts. We are not our thoughts. I can't stress that enough, how we buy into our thoughts as full fact and full truth, and we don't second guess them sometimes. Um, we don't have to believe everything we think. For example, have you ever thought to yourself, I don't want to go to work today? Probably snooze, and then you get up and you go, you go to work. Um, you know, you might think at some time like, oh, I could just I could just kill my boss. But you don't actually start plotting your boss's death. Right. Um, you can pick and choose which thoughts you can latch on to and which ones to let go of. Um, let me see about time if I have time to go into this metaphor. Mm. I'll come back to it if, if we have more time. Um, so changing the way you think begins by paying attention to your thought process and spend some time throughout your day just self-reflecting on the way in which you think. So um, practice positive. Eileen, it seems like we lost your audio. Oh, it looks like we, oh, she's coming back. Hi, everybody. This is Robin again. It looks like Eileen got disconnected for, oh, I think she's back. Are you back, I'm Eileen? Back. I'm back. Um, I'm not sure if you guys were, was I saying about checking in with our thoughts? <laughs> I think that's good. a good to okay. start again. I think that might have been when we lost you. Okay. Um, sorry about that, everyone. Let's see. Um, Okay, so we want to increase our ability to attend to our thoughts throughout our day. And the more we can do that, the more we can influence our thoughts and hence change how we feel or influence how we feel.
write down your thoughts throughout the day or set an alarm to do check-ins throughout the day, that can be helpful. So once you're in the habit of bringing more awareness to your thoughts and you start to recognize what your thoughts are, you can ask yourself if you, and look at them and, and ask yourself if you're doing any thinking errors. So for example, if you noticed a thought like, I should have used my time better this weekend, I'm so lazy. Um, you'll be surprised how often we are hard on ourselves when you start paying attention to your thoughts. So for the example, like I should have used my time better this weekend, I'm so lazy. That's an all or nothing thinking error. Um, are you really just lazy, period? Or are you thinking in black and white terms, right? Maybe you needed a weekend to relax because you have been stressed, for example. So you can also you can also do this and work backwards. So if you notice you're stressed, angry, overwhelmed, sad, um, you can go back and then ask yourself, what am I thinking and why? So you can either identify your thought and then see how it affects your feelings, or you can do backwards and identify your feeling and then see what your thoughts are that are creating those feelings. So we're not. I'm gonna take questions here in a moment, but I'm going to share two more slides on this process before we pause for questions. So here um, are, are the steps again. Um, so once you notice your thoughts, we want to work on changing them. So if you have an upsetting thought, something like I can't get anything done around here, move to step two and notice the feeling identify it, and then rate the feeling on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most intense. So if I feel like I can't get anything done around here, I'm feeling stressed at maybe an eight on a scale of zero to 10, and I'm frustrated at maybe a six. So then we're gonna try and weaken the thought by refuting it or disputing it. So think about some ways you can dispute the idea that you can never get anything done around here and make more realistic statements or at least try and see the gray. So for instance, um, with the thought, like everyone feels something like everyone feels stressed and frustrated from time to time might be a more realistic statement. It would be impossible to be 100% perfect. No one is. I'm, I'm working on ways to better manage my Things are going to come up all the time that distract us from, from the task and it's okay. And today I got done and maybe go through what you did get done. Um, today I got done maybe filling out paperwork for the grant or cleaning the cages. I made two phone calls, I ordered supplies, or maybe I did enrichment for 80% of the animals. So essentially you're coming up with a more accurate appraisal of the situation to help alleviate some of the emotion. Um, and then you're gonna go back and re-rate how your emotion changed, like how did your you decrease. So let me show you one other way. It's the same. Eileen, your audio seems to be cutting in and out, and I'm showing that it's it's there's some audio loss for you. Um, I think we're having some issues with her internet connection. Looks like she's reconnecting. So. So hopefully. Okay, sorry for the interruption, everybody. Hi, Robin, can you hear me? I can hear you now. It looks like your internet connection keeps experiencing some issues. Um, cause yeah, it's, it's what's going on. Um, do you want me to call in, or maybe if it goes out again, I'll call in? We can do that. If it goes out again, then you can go ahead and call in. Okay. Um, so this is another example of how you can do this thought restructuring process that I was just talking about. So let's run through. Um, let's run through just the bottom one, um, just as an example. And you can always ask me questions after. Um, so the, the you want to identify the situation. So maybe I have nothing to do on my day off. The thought could be no one wants to hang out with me, I'm not cared about. And that makes three feelings come up, maybe a lonely at a scale of eight, a sad at a six, and an anxious at a five. And then you wanna refute the, 
the original thought or weaken it or find the gray area. So you might say to yourself, nope, everyone's lonely at times. It's a normal emotion. I'm a kind and caring person. People like these qualities. Um, maybe I could join a book club to extend my. And so then you'll want to recheck in in the emotions. The emotion, maybe the lonely goes down by two numbers and is now a six. The sadness goes down at five and anxiousness at a two. Why do we do this? It's easier to manage, um, let's say, anxious at a two than it is at a five. The process is not about getting rid of the No, I, I don't think know if that's always possible. Okay. Yes. Uh, you you keep cutting in and out now. It's like it, it keeps coming and going. Okay. Is there where is the number for me to call in? It's up at the top of your screen above the side. Do you see either a little telephone icon or a audio or microphone icon? Okay. Let me let me try to log in then. Let me try calling in. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry, everybody. You just can't control internet connection sometimes. And the speed affects the audio and the video capability. So we'll get Eileen on the phone and we should be good to go. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to use that chat over on the left-hand side of your screen and we'll make sure to pass those along to her. Robin, can you hear me? Yep, you sound good. Okay, so when my computer does lock back in, I'll turn my computer off to mute so you don't hear me two times. Okay, and perfect. Let me... Okay. So I've muted that. Um, so are you able to change the slides for me then? Yes, I sure can. If you just tell me to go to the next one. Next one. Okay. You might have to, Eileen, turn the volume on your speakers on your computer all the way down too. Are you still there? I am, yes. There? I'm waiting to turn my volume down. Okay. Okay. Um, so, going to the next slide, I just hit it, so I'm wondering if it's going to go or if you'll need to do it. It just came up for me. It's the self-awareness acceptance slide. Okay, great. So, I will, okay, sorry, everyone. Um, okay, so, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about self-judgment. Um, this is important before we can talk about acceptance. So we judge our feelings, and um, we tend to make things worse that way. So we judge ourselves on all sorts of things. We, we judge our appearance, how we act, what we say. We judge our mistakes, et cetera. Um, we also judge our emotions, and we criticize ourselves for having emotions. I think for many of us, we're taught that we should not have uncomfortable emotions. Um, that, and that's probably from hearing things that are taught to us and, you know, to dismiss or minimize our emotions, like don't cry, it's okay, you need to be tough, um, or things like girls should be sweet. So these messages can come from our families or from our society. So for many of us, instead of feeling our feelings, we criticize ourselves for having them, and we just really want to get rid of them. Um, we call ourselves weak, dramatic, maybe stupid, or too sensitive. So we, okay, so that's kind of the background on us judging our feelings. A little bit more information. So we have a primary emotion and we have a second, we have secondary emotion. So a primary emotion is our initial reaction. Let's say I'm anxious. The secondary emotion arises from our self-judgment. For example, I'm so mad that I'm anxious or this is ridiculous. Um, Another example would be like, if you feel anxious, you might judge yourself and say, here we go again. Why does this always have to happen to me? This just isn't fair. So 
now you're not just dealing with the primary emotion of feeling anxious, but now your work is cut out for you even more because now you're having to deal with the frustration or you being mad or you're criticizing yourself. So now you have two things to deal with instead of just one. So what we try to do is eliminate the self-judgment and just say, you know what, I'm anxious and that's where I'm at and that's okay because this is how I'm feeling. Now how do I begin to cope with it? Um, so remember earlier on when I talked about experiential avoidance. So this is kind of what I'm referring to where we have an emotion and then we judge it. Um, we're trying to avoid the emotion. We're, we're upset that we're having it. We're not accepting it. So um, you want to try not to wish your emotion away, to battle with yourself over it. You know, the important thing here is that we can't, we can't criticize our way out of feeling a certain way. It, I don't know if it's un, ever worked for anybody. Um, you know, telling ourselves simply not to be sad or not to be stressed doesn't work. So instead, we need to work on accepting the emotion and the here and now moment for what it is and not judge it. Um, because really, at the end of the day, emotions can't go away unless you accept them. Um, you know, emotions are there to tell us something. So stop and listen to what your emotion is trying to tell you. Be curious about it and try not to judge it. Right, so easier said than done, but this is, again, a skill set to practice. Okay, so moving on, we're going to talk about perspective taking. And I have a couple of just fun cartoons. Um, perspective really changes everything. If we can change our perspective, we can change how we feel, and we can change our approach. Okay, so Robin, if you're available, I am. Um, yeah, I'm going to use Robin as a participant to walk through this. So we're going to talk about this end table, and then we're going to take what we go over and we're going to apply it to real life. So, th so um, Robin, if you pretend this end table is real and it's in front of you, <laughs> I want I want you <laughs> to tell me just just the facts about this end table. What are the facts? Don't give me, you know, no thoughts, no feelings. Just describe the table based on the facts. Um, it's got a rectangular top wood. Um, it's got, it's, it's held up by two black legs and a black base. Yeah, that, that's fine. We can pause there. So if, if we were to bring in 10 people into this and ask them, like, is this true? Is what Robin is telling us, is this true? Is this the facts about the table? What do you think those 10 people would say? I would say probably they would agree. <laughs> yeah, totally. They would totally agree. And why would they agree? Because there should be just the facts. They're just the facts. Just Yeah. What's you can there? exactly. You can measure it. You can touch it. You can confirm everything that you're saying. Okay, so we're gonna keep going with this. Um, so the next slide is really just showing everything that that Robin had described to us. Okay, so now, um, Robin, can you? tell me your perspective of the end table. And when I say perspective, I mean what are your thoughts, what are your feelings or opinions about the end table? Personally, I feel like it's very oddly shaped. I don't know how well, it doesn't look to me like it might hold things very well or it might tip over. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of okay. this particular Great. end table. Great. Okay, and if we brought, let's just, your person number one, let's say we bring in a second person, would they 100% agree with what your perspective is? No, they would not. Okay. They may or may not. Some may, some may not. Right. So could you give me um, another perspective that's different from your own? That maybe um, number, person number two might say, for example. 
Person number two might say, this is a very well-designed table. I, I love the design. It's very much my aesthetic, and um, I, I feel like it's a very useful piece of furniture. Okay. And if we were to invite number person three in, what might their perspective be that's different from person number one and person number two? They may just be totally unaffected or may not even have an opinion. They may yeah. just feel it's nothing. Okay, great. So this is where if we were to keep going, right, person four, person five, person six, this is where it starts to get harder because we have to think outside of our own perspective. So I'll give you a couple other examples. So person number four might come in and be like, oh, you know what? Um, actually, this table is awesome, but if I remove the wood part, I could make the metal frame um, a really nice piece of artwork on the wall. Maybe it doesn't make sense to us, but that's what they're seeing. Maybe person number five comes in and says, you know what, this table is dangerous. It's um, a foot and a half to two feet high, and it's perfect for my three-year-old running around at home to crack their head on the corner of the wood. Okay, so what's my point in all this? My point is, is that all day long we take in facts about the world around us. They're true and authentic facts, but then we make interpretations on those facts to bring our own perspective. And our perspective, right, the interpretations that we're making on these facts are based on our histories, our current moods, our taste, our preferences, our experiences, our age, our current life circumstance, for example. So, you know, if, if someone doesn't have a three-year-old running around at home, they may never see this table as dangerous. Um, if you aren't an artist who likes to deconstruct things, you might never look at this table as something that could be really useful for you. So does this make sense? Okay. If there's no questions, I'll keep, I'll keep going. So the, the main takeaway is that we walk around all day. There's real facts in front of us, but then we put our own spin on, on the facts, right? So um, we'll put this into a real-life situation now. So um, I'll give you um, – I'm going to just give one example just because of time. So um, we want to state the facts of a situation. We don't want to include any feelings, any thoughts, just the facts. So the fact, the situation I'm going to give you is that you asked a coworker to go to lunch twice this week, and both times they said no, and they were really short with you, um, almost kind of rude. So you identify your current perspective, and that perspective might be, oh, gosh, like, I wonder if she's mad at me or he's mad at me. I wonder if they like me, just as an example. So then we want to pick a perspective that might serve us better. And when I say serve us better, I mean help us feel better. I mean, we there's a billion perspectives in the world. Why pick the ones that make us feel bad? So another perspective could be, no, that coworker is really stressed, and when they're stressed, they tend to withdraw. Or maybe they're fighting with their significant other at home. Maybe they can't afford lunch. Um, or maybe they need personal quality time because they need to recharge in the middle of their day. Or maybe this week is particularly stressful and they just want to be alone. Um, okay, so how do you come up with new perspectives? Um, this type of perspective taking, I would also say, is like giving yourself some self-compassion. It's not that they don't like you. It's that there's other things going on that you might not be aware of. So if you have trouble picking other perspectives that serve you better, if you don't really know the facts of what's going on and why somebody might have been rude or short to you, for example, um, and you're having a hard time coming up with other perspectives, ask yourself, what would I tell my best friend? Or even, what would I say to my 10-year-old self? Right? If a, if a 10-year-old child or your 10-year-old self came up to you and said, my coworker was so mean to me, not just today, but yesterday, like, I think they're mad at me, you'd probably tell your 10-year-old self or 10-year-old child, like, why do you think that? Like, it sounds like you've been really nice to your friend and maybe they're going through a hard time, right? So the way we talk to other people and support other people is a lot more compassionate and caring and gentle than we talk to ourselves. Any questions with perspective taking? 
Okay. I don't have anything yet. Thanks, Eileen. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to touch on meditation and mindfulness. Um, we have about 70,000 thoughts a day. Most of them are about the future, which tends to be anxiety when we think about the future, or thoughts about the past, which tends to be like rumination or sadness or possibly depression when we think about the past. So very few of our thoughts throughout the day are in the current, present, here and now moment. Um, we do have some of those thoughts. It's like when you take a sip of coffee and you're like, oh, that's so good. Or when you walk outside and you go, oh, it's such a beautiful day out. Um, so when you're stressed, when you're sad, when you're anxious, this is a great tool. If you guys want to grab something near you, I don't care if it's food, a piece of food. I don't care if it's a pen or something that you're drinking. Just grab something that's near you, keys, whatever, and look down at it. Look down at the object and stare at it, study it, look at the shapes, textures, the line, look at the colors, how does this object feel in your hand, is it smooth, is it rough, what is the temperature, Does it smell like anything? And really look at it with a mindful, with a mindfulness that you wouldn't usually do over such an object. Okay, so this was a really quick tutorial, but just taking a moment, it doesn't matter what it is, to engage your five senses takes us out of our head and into the here and now present moment. So on this next slide, you will see um, a grounding exercise. But um, basically, mindfulness is a grounding technique. It anchors us to the here and now moment. It keeps us from getting lost in the past. Um, it keeps us at times perhaps feeling safe or in control and provides us with comfort. It also helps engage our parasympathetic nervous system, which is the system that slows, um, it calms us down. And this will thus decrease stress and anxiety. So, um, you know, because of time, I think I'm going to uh, move along. But other mindfulness activities that you can engage in outside of the, like, here and now check in, grab an object, stare at it, you know, sit outside, absorb the sun. You want to use all five of your senses if possible, you know, staring at like an inanimate object. Maybe some of you grabbed your keys, or your pen, like I'm not going to, it's probably not going to smell like anything and you're certainly not going to taste it, but as many senses as you can engage will bring you to the here and now moment. Um, other activities like dancing, singing, being in nature, photography, um, those are also very like mindful, grounding um, exercises. Okay, so benefits of meditation. Um, there are both short and long-term benefits to meditation. It does help with anxiety, depression, fear, anger. Um, it does help the body to heal itself. Yeah. For those of you that are on a time restriction, I only have about four more slides if you are able to stay on um, the webinar and, and keep up with us. I'm going to do a meditation exercise. Um, I, so I won't do as long as I was planning on doing it, but hopefully something to bring you guys some um, an experience with it as well as something to take away. So go ahead and get comfortable in your seat. Hopefully you guys aren't somewhere noisy, but if so, just focus in on my, my voice. Go ahead and close your eyes if you're comfortable and take a deep breath in and out. And take another deep breath in and out. 
One more breath in and out. Now I want you to imagine a ball of light at your abdomen. It can be any color, any density, whatever feels right. And imagine that ball, that circle of light in your lower abdomen. And extend a cord from that ball straight down into the ground, straight into earth. And take a deep breath as you continue to imagine that sphere of light. And get rid of all of any of the uncomfortable stress or sadness in your body and discharge it into that ball and down through that cord and into the earth. Get rid of all the negativity, all the stress, all of what does not belong to you that's uncomfortable, collect in that ball of light and discharge through that cord and into the ground to be released. It is not yours to hold on to. And feel yourself get lighter as you do this. Now, imagine the universe above you, the sky, the sun, the clouds. It can be the stars. It can be the galaxy, the universe, the Milky Way, whatever you want. But picture all of the energy above you in the world. And start to see and feel that energy from the universe start to spin down through the top of your head, and recharge your whole body with goodness and relaxation and strength and positive energy. Imagine it channeling down through the sky into your head and through your body. Let it fill you from your head to your feet to your fingertips. And now imagine a protective sphere around you, an energetic ball, a sphere of energy around you to protect you so that no one can take your energy, no one can send you bad energy. It's your safety. And it can look like whatever you want, and it can be as big as and extend as far out as you want. You are in your protective bubble. And imagine that this bubble will walk around with you for the rest of the day, keeping you safe and energized. And when you're ready, take a couple deep breaths and come back to the webinar. Okay, so this was a really quick mindfulness meditation exercise um, just to give you a little bit of a example or a taste of options. Um, if you're interested in more there's um, an app called Headspace that has a lot of good meditations or mindfulness exercises for you to be walked through. And also YouTube is actually a great one to, to um, use. Um, so, okay, so moving on. Um, neuroplasticity, um, this is basically our ability for the brain to form new connections and eliminate old ones in our brain that are not being used. And this happens throughout our entire life. So the brain continues to develop and rewire itself throughout, throughout your whole life. And new experiences can change the structure of your brain and the functioning, which is pretty cool. So how does this relate? Well, in very short, simple terms, this relates to us because um, let's just talk about thinking for a moment, such as 
thinking errors. They're so automatic. They happen so quickly. We barely even notice that they're happening. So what do we want to do? We want to rewire our brain so that it doesn't automatically go to the self-criticizing or the negativity or certain statements that you might say to yourself all the time, like, I'm lazy. Your brain knows how to fire that neural pathway. It fires it all the time. So we want to rewire the brain by um, implementing new coping skills, right? So something like cognitive restructuring that we talked about will rewire your brain. It's hard to do, but it, it does happen over time, and those neural pathways get worn and... Um, um, easier to tap into and access. So due to time, I was going to go into this metaphor about cornfields that I really love, but I'm going to skip over that. Essentially, the main takeaway is, is that um, practicing these coping skills, you can rewire your brain and over time start to feel better. Okay, so I have two more slides. I know we're losing some people because of time, and I want to be respectful. So um, our brain is, a, is an awesome organ, and it really is powerful, and it pays attention to the negative experiences more than the positive ones. There's a reason for that, and it's more to do with our evolutionary survival. You know, if we can see the bad and figure it out, it increases our chances of survival. So negative events pose... Um, a chance of danger and potential threat. So awareness of positive um, aspects do take deliberate effort because it's not necessarily linked to our survival per se. So in general, we need five positive things for every one negative. Total bummer, but um, that's what, um, the, sorry, I had a call come in. So in general, we need five positive things for every one, so five to one ratio. However, a one to three ratio in real life can put you in an upward spiral. So how do you do this? Um, a gratitude journal. It doesn't have to be a long letter to yourself. It might just be a list at the end of the day or the beginning of the day of the things that were good, no matter how sweet or small they were. Um, and another another option is um doing check-ins throughout the day and listing three things that went well today. Um, mindfulness in small amounts is very helpful. Savoring the good stuff. So if you um, have a busy day and you're able to be outside, you know, just taking, you know, 10 seconds to really focus on what a beautiful day it is or how the air feels on you. So really making an effort to focus on the positive things can actually be a huge um, shift in our moods as research shows. Okay, the last slide, um, positivity and silver linings, finding meaning and purpose when we're sad or stressed. Um, this is hard to do in the moment, but on particularly rough days, I like to remind myself that my track record for getting through bad days so far is 100%, and that's pretty good. So ask yourself, is there anything good about this experience for me? Is there anything for me to learn? How is this changing me? Um, maybe even asking yourself, if the universe were sending me a message, what would that be? Um, so trying to just take our life difficulties and um, just, again, this is a way to put a different perspective on it. Try to see things from a different angle in a way that's more productive and puts us more in control to feel more empowered. Um, so, okay, so to wrap up, thank you everybody for joining today. Um, I am sorry about the, some of the technical difficulties. Hopefully there's some major and wonderful good takeaways from, from this that you can implement. And if anybody has questions, please feel free. You can um, email me. Uh, probably the easiest way to find me would be on my website, Next Step, singular counselingchicago.com, nextstepcounselingchicago.com, and feel free to email me if you have any questions um, at all. So, yeah, thank you very much. Excuse me. I, I want to say a huge thank you to Eileen for this whole great series. Um, I've learned so much, and, and you've given me a lot of tools that I'll be able to use personally. Um, so I want to say a huge thank you, and I want to say thank you to everybody for attending today. And I will be getting out information um, regarding the recording 
and a PDF copy of the slides to you, and that will be in the next day or two once the recording is up and ready. So again, thank you, everybody, and thank you so much, Eileen, for the great series. Absolutely. More than happy to do more. <laughs> awesome. We, we appreciate that. We will definitely be in touch. Um, okay. so again, thank you, everybody, and I hope you all have a great day. Bye. 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 Thanks, Eileen.